Hello Hitchhikers, you're listening to AHK42.com, a Hitchhiker's Guide to 42. Today's guest, we've got Simon the Amazing Clark back to speak with us. But first, some music by Kevin Ryan, One Band. Check out Kevin Ryan's One Band at Facebook, One Spirit Music, or One X The Band. And here's Simon Clark. Welcome, Simon, back on the show. Hi, Leah. Thanks for having me back on again. Brilliant. It's great to have you back because we have so much to talk about. So, oh, so many, so many topics. Yes, and today what we were going to uh, be uh, starting on again is the Bulbeck Stones. We're going to go into a little bit more detail about that, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's something that's covered by uh, quite a few other people. Um, uh, Brian Forrester, I think he's a Canadian. He has some uh, really good videos on YouTube. Mm. Uh, and Graham Hancock, who's uh, uh, an English guy uh, who's been looking at this for the last, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 years, you know, all, all the topics that I'm interested in, yeah. he's been looked at. But both of them seem to go to this place as and will sort of point out uh, where rocks have been carved. And, and, you know, there's obviously a machine tool has gone over something, mm. but they don't sort of follow up on the investigations. They do an awesome job. Uh, I mean, Graham was a, a, an investigative journalist mm. uh, for many years uh, previously. Um, so they do an awesome job of researching to a point. And it's sort of from there that I really sort of want to go on. So um, as I mentioned in the previous program, and for any listeners who haven't heard that one yet, uh, Baalbek is in uh, Lebanon. Yeah. Um, this huge thousand-ton megalithic uh, boulders there that have been carved into um, perfect uh, rectangular blocks. Yeah. Now, the, uh, there's a big broken one that's sort of rested in the middle of middle, middle of nowhere, which is actually right next to the quarry. But the ones that were cut in square are built and are now in the base of the Temple of Jupiter, uh, which the actual temple is Roman. And you can see by the block size, um, because the Romans were limited to about five tons lifting capacity yeah. it could do a bit more but basically five tons is the sort of round figure uh but they're stacked on top of these huge mo- mega monsters now the other thing with these uh which i obviously didn't touch on last time is the edges of these blocks are perfectly vertically straight so 14 foot tall blocks meet each other so close that you can't get a piece of paper in the gaps right so what Let's rewind a little bit. Okay. What, what is the Temple of Jupiter, Simon? Right. Apart from being uh, built by the Romans, I don't know. Right. 
Um, what it was used for by the Romans is, to be honest, it's too new um, for the sort of work that I look at. It's it's something built on a... It's like a modern housing estate built on a, a Roman Colosseum for, you know, sort of general... Okay, like, you know. okay thank you. Yeah. Um, but it's the... Um, as I say, it's not just the size of these blocks being over a 1,000 tonnes. It's the fact that when they're, they're built, there's no mortar in between them. Um, if you cut in stone, if you cut in metals and all sorts of things, sometimes it's nice to have, or especially with stone and brick, uh, a bonding agent between the two to hold them together. But also it takes out any slight inaccuracies you've got from the construction method. Right. So bricks are not always square. You know, it's made of sand, so it's always looking a bit rough. Um, and you can't guarantee having a vertical face on it. Mm-hmm. But if you put mortar between the two, you know, the mortar just squishes in and out and, you know, you end up with a perfectly bonded surface. But the, these things aren't. And as I say, at 14 foot tall and 14 foot wide, to have a perfectly flat face that touches the next one perfectly straight. So part of my investigation would include how would this be possible? Right. Well, one way to do it is start off with a, a, a block that's longer or two blocks that are longer, cut it with a circular saw on both edges, then push them together. That would give you, that would give you the um, the, the two perfectly flat faces that, that would that, that would work in that situation. Yes. So one of the things to do is to measure the blocks under the Temple of um, Jupiter, and then go back to this this huge block that they left behind, and see if it's slightly longer. So that could be potentially one of the ways that the um, that they cut them. Yeah, so it's a little bit more of evidence that could be brought together, basically, Absolutely. from ev- from research of two different stones at different yes. areas. Right. Yes, different uh, different ways of bringing, bringing them together. Yeah. And then the other thing to look at is the actual quarry itself. Um, obviously, to get a rock out uh, of that sort of size, you've got to, uh, first of all, start off with a flat top. Mm-hmm. Then you've got to cut down, um, down one of the sides and, and both ends. And then you've got to try and cut it underneath, but by supporting it as you, as you lift it out. So, you know, are, if we go and find where the cut marks are, are these parallel? Uh, because in Egypt, they tell us that the, the, the locals there, they used stones and pounded them against the side of things to actually cut the stone away. Oh, OK. <laughs> so, but if you go and look at the uh, unfinished obelisk in, in Egypt, uh, you'll notice that the, the cuts down either side of, of this huge object are parallel. So, well, they look parallel, but obviously we need to go and measure them to actually go and ascertain as to whether they actually are 100%. Yes. Um, so that that's really where I'd like to go with um, with we're looking at, at Bolbeck, really. Right. Uh, and it's also a shame that no one has actually put on the internet any measurements or anything to, to be precise. Do you think there is anything out there? I mean, you said to the... Well, you haven't been aware of them, but do you think is there has there been any measurements of any stones like um, megalithic stones at all? The well, yeah, this this comes out of something quite interesting that even though we measure it as being seventy feet long or um, twenty two meters, I think it is, uh, if you divide it out that way. There's also two um, measurements that we know of. One is a thing called the Neolithic yard. Right. Uh, and the other one's the Egyptian cubit. Yes. Ah, OK. Yeah. So if you if you see any programmes on, or any films uh, based in Egypt, they always talk about, if they talk about measurements, they talk about the cubit. Uh, and I, I'd always be sort of curious as to what that is. Mm. Well, that's got just over half a metre long. Right. Uh, about, uh, just over 20 inches, basically. Oh, OK. But the, the Neolithic yard is 2.72 feet to be precise. Oh, okay. So when we measure things over, you know, like it's like stone circles, for example, or if you go to um, Stonehenge, and if you measure it, you go, oh, it's, it's so many metres or so many feet, and it might not ring bells. Mm. But if you go to an ancient site and actually measure it using either cubits, or if you measure it in cubits and measure it in nearly yards, mm. you might find it fits exactly. So... One of the things I did uh, as part of my investigation and one of the things that was nice to do rather than internet research and watching YouTube, etc., is to actually physically go to a stone circle. During the week, I work uh, near the southern edge of the Lake District on the Furness Peninsula. Recently, I went to um, 
go and explore at a stone circle actually physically uh, so that was exciting oh, cool. um on the southern edge of the lake district is the furnace peninsula uh and you know a lot of people know of alderston the birthplace of stan laurel well just near there there's a uh, uh an area of countryside called berkeley common and on the seaside on the seaward edge of that uh there's a double stone circle which was interesting mm. um a double a double circle sorry yes oh yes. Wow, okay interesting yeah. uh i i didn't know they existed no. they they apparently do oh, okay but uh and what was interesting is the the internal blocks i start off with these seemed very square and quite small really i i worked out the weight uh to be about one and a half tons each mm. now um, one and a half tons, as I mentioned in the previous program, I consider it to be about manhandleable. Uh, if you can carve it in one place, a few of you, you know, with, with some work and effort, can can move it to another place and, and stand it up. But looking at these stones, they, they look too manufactured to me. It's almost um, as if someone brought them up in the 1800s on, on horse and cart, oh. because the outer stone circle are a lot bigger, but they're all worn down. Oh, right. Do you think someone's been mirroring... And trying to copy then? Yeah, that, that that that's what I that's the sort of feeling I get when I'm when I'm there. Yeah. Um, the the Berkeley Common is actually uh, an ancient um, uh, coral uh, outcrop. Okay. Because um, coral, to, based on the coral polyps, uh, as they create their shells, that that becomes limestone. Okay. So it's a huge limestone hill. Mm. Uh, there's various sort of chunks taken out of this hill where. People have quarried it over the years. So I do wonder if someone sort of looked at it and went, oh, that's a bit worn out. Let's put some new ones in. Mm. So that, 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 could be the, that could be the reason. Right. But, but the outer ones, the, these inner ones, they're about 18 inches square. Mm. Uh, so using old, old numbers. Oh. Yeah, so these, um, these stones look to be about 18 inches square uh, and about, um, about a metre-ish tall, about three feet tall. So, yeah, they look to, to me to be uh, manufactured. But the outer ones, these are about three foot square. They're literally about a metre by a metre. Right. Uh, so, now, these would have weighed a lot more. I've not got a clue what height they were because they're literally worn down to about the grass level. Right. Um, although there was one on its side, and that was, about, that was about six to eight feet long. Are they worn down or are they deeper, like the... Um... Oh, the, the uh, statues on Easter Island. Yes. Is that where you're going? Yeah, mm. yeah. That's a very interesting story. We'll, we, we can look at that in a second. Um, are they worn down or are they deeper? I think these are worn down. When you look at the top, there's a slight nodule at the top uh, with the edges sloping down that look quite smooth. Right. When rain lands on limestone, it actually uh, forms an acid and it, and it cuts it away, yeah. which is why if you go into deep caverns, you end up with stalagmites and stalactites. Right. right. So... And all the all the inner circle, uh, all the tops were slightly uh, shaped in the sort of similar sort of fashion, okay. slightly coned off. So that, that so it's very difficult to um, see how big these were height wise, mm. but certainly from their sort of width and um, or the, the cross sectional area, mm. these seem to be very big blocks. And these to me would be very difficult to move um, to that sort of location. Right. So how far away from the limestone hill you called it, didn't you? Yeah. How far away were these from that hill? Oh, if, if they cut them at the top, these were I don't know, 100 yards, 200 yards up down the hill. Okay. So, again, it would sort of seem possible and probable. Mm. So my investigation with stone circles in the UK is going to continue. Mm. But I'm looking for ones where, like you just sort of trying to sort of intimate there, that, you know, where does the stone come from? Is it, is it local? Is it from a long way away? And and if it's, you know, if, if we get to blocks of weighing about 10 tonnes apiece mm. and it's not local stone, then, then how did it get there? Yeah. In order for the listeners to, to hear, you said there's two circles, yeah? It's a circle within a circle, Within yes. a circle. And then you've got the Karnak stones, which are in a straight line. Yes. And then with the Bolbeck, you're saying it's a, a construction site. Yes, yes. So, so do you think they were making them there and then moving them from Bolbeck? Um, well, the, the, the Bolbeck quarry is about half a mile away from the, the actual uh, Temple of Jupiter itself. All right. Uh, so that's, that's where they were using them from. The, uh, the, Car the standing stones in Karnak, and I say there's, there's 10 rows, and each row, well, you know, from one, one picture you can look at, 
there's about 50 in a row. I don't know how far these go, whether it's half a mile or a mile or so. So there's, there's hundreds of these. Now, whether they're a local stone or not, I don't know. That's that's something I need to get out to France for and uh, and have a look at. We have to get a GoFundMe Simon page <laughs> to get you Absolutely. over there. Absolutely, if we can, can get you uh, over there. You know, if, if, we, if we can work something out with uh, with, with the listeners, um, with, with like say a GoFund site, yeah. then obviously you know anything I find or you know the research I do, I'll, I'll come back and and tell the listeners on the yeah. on your program. Get some videos on as well. Have you actually okay. heard of the guy who's in South Africa and he's found stone circles there? Yes. And such an interesting guy. Yeah. yeah, could you remind me of his name, please, Simon? No. <laughs> no. Right, I'll we'll, have to. We'll, well, we'll have to do some research and, and, and have that on a, a, another time. But, yeah, yeah the, the, he, the Well, circle. basically, he, he would walk into the middle of these circles and the compass wouldn't know north, east, south or west. The... the yeah. Um, just like the, the listeners are a little bit more in-depth. So, whereas a stone circle is a stone circle, these are like, if you were building a, a mud hut, you might build like a three foot high wall, most of the way around the wall, round around the hut, and then you'd have a gap where your doorway is, and then you'd sort of build up the sides and put your roof on. So, these are sort of collapsed walls, but none of them have doorways. Mm. Uh, the authorities have sort of said, oh, well, there the must be cattle pens. Yeah, but how do the cattle get in and out? Well, it's like you said, uh, as you walk into them, your compass goes all over the place. Mobile phone loses signal. And they have this company that went into one one area of the Tinua. Mm. And they have these, I don't know if you've seen them, but if you want to get 100% accurate uh, measurement data, they go in with a pole with a, 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 ra a, um, a satellite tracking unit on top of this pole. Uh, and it will tell you exactly your location. So it picks up, I don't know, it's like 10 satellites. Whereas oh. you, can't, you can't, and it picks up sort of three satellites. Oh, right. Uh, but they, these are sort of millimetre accurate. Right. So the, 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 they, went, they went around this one, this one location and went through the middle of it. Anyway, he's supposed to get the results in a week to, to prove that he was wrong. That's really what someone was trying to do, is prove that he was completely nutter and he was wrong. Mm. Anyway, so a week came and went, two weeks came and went, three weeks. He phoned them back up. He said, you know, where's my data? He said, uh, um, we, uh, yeah, we're just struggling. Yeah. <laughs> he said, to be honest, we haven't got any data. <laughs> oh. Outside the circle, we know exactly where it is. Inside the circle, it cannot pick up the satellites. That is strange. And I've also oh. found who we were talking about with the South African circles. It's Michael Tellinger. Michael Tellinger, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yes, I've seen him before, yes. Mm. <laughs> mm. We're going to take a little break. Be back in a bit. Become part of the UK Ghost Hunters family, whether as part of a team or as an individual. As part of the UK Ghost Hunters family, you or your team will be able to benefit from the team's vast knowledge of the field and potentially be part of the show Paranormal Excursion. To submit your application, please visit www.uk-ghosthunters.com or our UK Ghost Hunters Facebook page. You did mention before uh, Easter Island. Um, now, some people might have known of these. You get the, I think they're called the Moai, uh, the, these statues. And you sort of see like 
the huge heads and shoulders. Mm. And some of them are just that, they are just the, the heads and shoulders, but in some occasions they've gone to dig them up to move them, and they've ended up digging down um, 20, 30 feet, mm. because they're an entire statue, they're a whole body. Yeah, and, neat. Now, one of the things to do with these uh, that would be interesting to do with one of the excavations is look at the material inside the, 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 the hole and, and go outwards, I don't know, 10, 20 feet mm. uh, and do a similar analysis at the same depth mm. and try and work out if it was placed in a hole, did the ground grow around it, mm. um, was it a statue and then was it covered up? Yeah. You know, and they, they can actually analyse all the different layers mm. to determine the age. So that... that I don't know if anyone's done that yet. That that would be really interesting to uh, mm. to look into. It certainly would. Because mm. it's, it's a bizarre, uh, the whole area, isn't it, with no trees around them and things like yes. that? Yes, yes. I have watched programmes on that um, that explain because the, the population grew. They kept having more land to cultivate and the trees weren't growing back. So they actually all end up starving to death. Mm. Um, Did uh, they find any but, bones or things like that with malnutrition? Now... <laughs> What, what shall we find my nutrition? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I know um, with regards to bones, and it, and it, uh, it again goes back to back to my book and other people's books, he thought, you know, where's the evidence of people who lived 10, 20, 30,000 years ago um, from these other uh, cultures that we we're all sort of saying that, that existed? Well, for bones to be preserved or bones to fossilise, you have to be in very certain conditions. Mm. You know, it's too moist. You know the um, the bones will just sort of the, the the bacteria will grow and just dissolve the bone, or animals will come along and eat them. Because yeah. um, one of the one of the things that um, people will say is they've never actually found any chimpanzee uh, fossils. Mm. Never found a chimpanzee bone in the wild mm. because they just you know, animals eat them. They break down mm. uh, very quickly. Yeah. Well, who's to say then? Um... That on that island, that, that that is exactly what happened. You see, what oh, I was absolutely. getting at was that, yeah. that that's like the theory, isn't it? But yeah. there could could be other explanations, and I haven't really absolutely. yet stumbled yeah. upon anybody else's ideas about what happened on that island. Absolutely, absolutely. You know? uh, and as I said last time, it is actually one of the points of the World Energy Grid. Ah, so it's at a point again. That you were talking yeah, about so like that, the last that's show. Nice point. It, it's like the place in on the, on the Horn of Africa. Yeah. You know, the, there's a whole city there that's just not there anymore. Yeah. But it's, yeah. On, it's, it's literally under one of these points. Yeah. Um, whether these, whether that was an energy grid and goes back to Michael Tellinger's work. Mm. Um, and is it Christopher Dunn, the engineer who. Is he coming on your show soon? Yes, he is. He's, yes. He is. Talk about the yes, power Yes, he's, he's got a couple of awesome books out, hasn't and, and, yeah. he? Giza yeah. Power. Um, the Giza Power Plant is what he's coming mm. on to talk about. But also, any updates, obviously, because the book's quite a fair, fair bit old. But yes, um, he's, if he's got any more updates, because obviously it fascinates him. So I would yes. like to see what news he's got to tell us all as well. So in Cairo, we've got energy generators. In Southern Africa, We've got uh, circles that uh, produce enough energy to disrupt a mobile phone. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's it's, it's interesting. There's more and more things coming to date, coming to light uh, every week. Mm, my goodness. Yes, yes. So it, if it disrupts, then does that mean the signal's gone? Or uh, there was there was a guy that went with him. Uh, my, a guy that went with Michael Tellinger to one of these sites. And he was measuring um, the energy output. And I can't remember, uh, again, that was in a certain hertz frequency. Right. He said, if we could see it, or if it was heat, mm. we'd, our bodies would be boiling now. But because it's a, it's a frequency that doesn't affect us, mm. um, so it's like energy is pouring out of the ground, going straight up. Yeah. But at this moment in time, we can't utilise it. We don't know really how to measure it. Mm. And because so many people uh, uh, negate it then, um, it's very hard to find people willing to fund to do more research into it. Mm. Yeah, this is a thing. It's bloody funding all the time. It funding, is, it is. funding or conflict or uh, reburial <laughs> of, of ancient yes. artifacts. <laughs> oh yes, that was the uh, the North American Indians, wasn't it? The yeah. uh, the, the giants. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
We'll move on then to another section that I was fascinated with. It, that was the aircraft SR-71, which was secret in the 1950s. Could you speak about that again? Yeah. More depth? Um, an awesome book by a guy called uh, Ben Rich describes the, the internal workings of the Skunk Works. Skunk Works was a subdivision of the Lockheed, what's now Lockheed Martin, uh, aircraft manufacturing company in, oh, I know it's North America. I'm trying to think it's near Los Angeles. Between, between Vegas and Los Angeles, it took over that way, um, and they did they did some awesome work. They built spy planes for the um, American government, specifically for the CIA. Mm. So the first one that they built, the U uh, two, was an ultra high altitude aircraft, but it was a conventional aircraft. Um, you can see that in the way it in the way it looks. Yes, it's ultra high, alt high altitude. They've done a lot of superb design work to it, but then they brought out the SR seventy one. This is a whole different, whole different aircraft. Mm. You know, still today, as far as I'm uh, aware, it holds the um, fastest speed aircraft speed records. Right. Uh, this thing would fly at Mach three for, wow. for hours, hours at a time. Awesome. Yeah, uh, altitude records. There's quite a funny story of um, one of the pilots calling up air traffic control tower and saying, "Like, um, I'd like, I'd like to fly to fifty thousand feet." Uh, the control and the, the controller came back with, well, how do you expect to get up there? He said, well, come down to there. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. This, this thing flew at 80,000 feet, you know, yeah, obviously incredible. But when you look at it, uh, the, the fuselage, rather than being round or oval, like sort of every other aircraft that I've sort of ever seen, mm. uh, you know, including Concorde. Concorde had a round fuselage. This, um, it had what, what was described as chines, which is basically, if you look at the front of it, it looks like a UFO, <laughs> to oh. be, be quite blunt. Yeah. Um, the, it... the the aircraft is know, about 15 to 20 foot wide, but it, from, from the outer points, from the left and right hand side, it comes up very slowly and then sort of begins to widen up to where the cockpit is. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing is this was designed about five years after the um, Roswell incident. Mm. So Interesting. It, Roswell was an alien UFO and that went to Wright Patterson Airfield and they examined some of the details on the aircraft mm. and some of that details was passed to companies that were making super secret aircraft at the time mm. then that could have very easily ended up in the SR-71 design yeah oh it'd be great to go <laughs> to like um, an aircraft uh, museum one time and see it there and you could just look at it and think about that <laughs> oh, I have, I have. You, I've have. Been, I've, uh, you know a lot of aircraft museums you know they've got the fences around you can't get near these things mm. but when I was in uh, in Alabama uh, they had a few aircraft in this museum and one of them was an SR-71 Oh. Uh, to be able to walk up to it and touch it and, and, and look at it. Oh, yeah, that was oh, brilliant. Outstanding. Yes. Who knows? It might be alien technology. <sighs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I mean, the, the, you got aircraft at the time that were barely breaking the, the sound barrier. Mm. I flew in 1953, I think it was, mm. 53. They'd only broken the sound barrier in 1947. Wow. And this thing went at three times the speed of sound. Wow, amazing. Yeah. I mean, um, just to get really scientific, if you double your speed, you get four times the air resistance. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving along in the car somewhere safe, uh, wind the window down and put your hand out the window at 30 miles an hour, you'll, you'll notice a bit of a breeze. But if you increase your speed to 60 miles an hour, then you'll think your hand really getting pushed back. Yeah. Yeah. So if you double again, double again, double again. So this thing's flying at 3,000 miles an hour, 8,000 feet. The air resistance is obviously incredible, which is why I have these uh, in incredibly sized um, engines on the side of it. Mm. Try, but all the nose you're... of the aircraft, you know, the whole aircraft had to be made out of t t titanium, uh, which is just like a new, new, super fantastic material at the time. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it basically got hot. The, the, the nose of the aircraft would actually glow. Amazing. Do you reckon that's why they glow in the dark? Which is going to get us to the new next question, because <laughs> the next question is going to be: You had something to say about one of our UFO Glens. Um, reports about the recent UK UFO reports that he... Um... Yeah, uh, I, I listened to last week's show. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, one of the things I was amazed with and I didn't realise is how much detail he has to actually go into mm. for these reports. I was um, 
you know, I assume that you, somebody says, well, I saw this thing in the sky and they sort of describe a shape and a, a direction. Mm. But he was asking the fellow, where were you? What time was it? Yeah. You know, he was going into fine detail. And, and I, I never thought that um, your phone investigators would have had to uh, go to that sort of uh, depth and detail. Yeah, I mean, we're going to put up a... Um... An example of a report on the site oh, so that people can have a look about what sort of things that he would like, as in info, when you report a site. And if you could include all these different um, answers to this sort of questionnaire. That would that'd be really good. Yeah, so people can uh, have a look at that and then they'll understand what sort of information is important. Because somebody might say, like someone said, the street lamps reflection it wasn't on the craft it's you know yes. they're looking at the lights and the street lamps and he said you know how important that was actually because yes light pollution can change your look at you know the look of something totally absolutely yeah because if you're looking at uh, i think they call them sodium lamps the the yellow street lights because yeah. white street white street lights don't cast the correct light if we if they use these yellow sodium ones and one i think it uses a lot less power but two, it actually lights up a lot more area, but it does change the colour of things. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. You were saying that um, one of the lights, you could possibly explain um, by, um, by the maybe, description maybe. of it. I mean, you the, was, you uh, had a when theory. When he said it, it was a green light that was moving, I thought, oh, I wonder. Because I can't remember on his, uh, when I listened to the, to the interview, I can't remember if he said it went from left to right or right to left. Because aircraft have uh, several lights on them that they're supposed to have on when they fly at, at night. They have a white light at the front. Uh, well, if the large aircraft, they have white light at the front, white light on the tail, uh, a red light on the top and bottom of the fuse large. And then they have navigation lights, which are, I think, it's green on the left and red on the right. Um, so if, it, if the aircraft, if the light that was seen was green going right to left, it could maybe have been an aircraft. If it was going left to right, then it wasn't, unless it was upside down. <laughs> mm, yeah. You're also saying um, that um, maybe yeah. one of the lights might have been broken. There is that, there is that. Um, the tail light, the, the, they don't actually show uh, in all direction. On a light aircraft, they have a small white light at the top of the fin, and that's not only white, but it, 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 um, uh, oh, it, 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 it's a flashing, it's a strobe light, that's the word I'm trying to, trying to mm -hmm. get out. It's a strobe light on top of the fin, so it's white, it flashes, and, and other people can see it. Uh, but the white light on the back of an aircraft doesn't shine out 180 degrees. It, it only does, I think it's about 130, 160 degrees. Mm. So only if you're actually behind the aircraft can you actually see it. So, yeah, there, there is the possibility that, you know, if you've got mal malfunctioning lights, uh, and as I say, if it was a green light and it passes left, uh, right to left, or if it's a red one passing left to right, mm. um, then that might have been an aircraft. I'm not saying it is. Okay. Uh, I, I, I witnessed um, about four, or five years ago. I witnessed a light I didn't, I didn't recognise, and I've, I've not, I've not managed to get uh, an explanation to yet. Oh, you have to report it to uh, UFO Glenn. You never know. Because well, he keeps to chat, so... chat with UFO Glenn, yes. Yeah, because at the end of the day, he keeps so many reports, and he was on yes. about um, on the interview that, or or one of his. Um, um, UK report um, briefings that he gave us, yes. um, citing reports briefings. He was on about that he has uh, some that backdate from years ago. You know, somebody would have said, oh, my granddad saw that, or, you know, a few years ago a lady reported something, and then somebody else will report something that happened a few years ago, and they just suddenly uh, come out with it. Because it takes yeah, a lot of time sometimes for people to talk about these things, doesn't it? It does, it does. I know... Um... Basically, if you're an airline pilot and, and someone, you know, someone from your company finds out that you've put a, a UFO report in, bang goes your job. Yeah. Um, they're, they're that harsh. Yeah. And I think the military is fairly similar as well. It's all this stigma. Oh, yeah. Oh, you think you saw something that was good, did you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not even the military now. Uh, yeah. yeah, because even commercial aircraft pilots don't even mention... I mean, they've got... I think it's the Black Book Project, the Black Vault or something like that, I think it, it is. A, a yeah, he's he's managed to get some um, some reports on how they report UFOs, and they do report yeah. them, but they're like yeah. not actually said that they're UFOs. Yeah, I, I like the guy that was the um, it was the deputy head of the um, FAA 
Federal Aviation Authority. And there's a Japanese uh, 747 flying from Japan to, I think it was San Francisco. But as he came over towards Alaska, you know, Alaskan radar picked up this huge blob next to him on the radar. He got in on his radar, and he was he was you know, almost panicking down the down the intercom or down the radio to the air traffic controllers. Mm. But this thing was huge and kept swapping sides and was getting in front of him. Yeah. You know, he's got sort of 400 passengers on board, and, and, and this thing that's bigger than him, which was like the biggest aircraft in the sky at the time, was all, o- all over him. He's trying to keep his cool. <laughs> trying to keep his cool, you know, he, he did an awesome job. But, uh, yeah, the really funny part about that was uh, when he uh, gave his statement at the 2001 UFO disclosure uh, in Washington, um, he said that the he'd reported this to the um, CIA, and they called him down to a meeting. So he went to the meeting, and they, and they went through uh, everything, and they sort of nodded their heads. Um, he said, "Right, this meeting didn't happen. This guy didn't see it. You don't know anything about it. Hand us all your material." So went, yeah, okay, fair enough. And he got back to the office and got the originals out from under his desk and went. What to do with these now? So we kept them. <laughs> <laughs> so the CIA actually only got copies. <laughs> oh no, that's good. Yeah. thank goodness he did that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, when, when people of these sort of statues start, uh, you know, saying, yeah, you know, this is this is real, this is happening, they are here, then yeah, yeah you have you have to sit up and listen. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's a little bit of controversy on the internet. I've, I've been reading into um, on a few Facebook sites recently, and uh, yeah. a lot of people are trying to uh, say that these government officials are uh, feeding what do they call it they're feeding um, false info disinfo oh, yeah. disinfo to yes yeah to, to tell the public that you know uh, the alien visitors uh, have come down but they're evil and they're so the, the CIA is evil and they're, 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 they're <laughs> devil worshippers and yeah it's all just crazy. Uh, I mean, so much chat that you can read into about all this absolutely, stuff. Absolutely. And I, I also like the fact that uh, NASA keep the rumours going that, um, you know, they, they love these conspiracy theorists to say, oh, we didn't land on the moon, we didn't land on the moon, and, yeah. and everyone's got to try and sort of prove, yes, we did. Yeah. Because, because no one then asked the question, right. well, how many UFOs were actually watching uh, Neil Armstrong as he climbed down the ladder? Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 they're sort of surrounded by these people. Yeah, bogey <laughs> at 10 o'clock high. Yeah, there <laughs> several on there, but anyway, yeah. Mm. So thank you, Simon, for coming on and speaking with us in a bit more detail about the This Will Blow Your Socks Off book. Um, you've got some more research that you'll be doing. You said you'd be coming back to tell us a bit about a bit more about your findings. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Uh, in the news uh, every week, there's, there's more and more information coming through. I mean, just last week, uh, you know, top scientists reckon that these uh, radio signals emanating from a star that's, I can't remember how far away it is, 20 light years, 50 light years or something, that they reckon that emanated from a, a, an alien planet. Mm. You know, top scientists are saying this. That, so it's almost as if they're acknowledging that there's alien life on other worlds, but not close to us. Uh, and then they're gonna, probably going to be start reducing these numbers down. Oh, we've discovered alien life on a on a planet twenty light years away, ten light years away. Five light. So yeah. I'll see if we can find out on that uh, uh, before I come on the next time. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, yeah, the, 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 all these new things always fascinate me, and uh, I'll keep me uh, keep me fingers on the pulse. Okay, I look forward to hearing from you soon. Excellent. Thanks ever so much, Leah. Thank Thanks. You. Goodbye. Take care now. Yeah. Bye. And that's it for today's show. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please check back on Friday. That's the 31st of March, 2017. We've got Dr. Arlen Andrews with us. And he's going to be talking about his new book, Silicon Blood. Have a great week and see you later. Hello, hello, hitchhikers. You're listening to AHU Radio 42.com. A hitchhiker's guide.